And I want to speak about this next season God's taking us into, and you guys particularly, he's bringing you into such an amazing, you're in a transition, transitioning into an incredible season where um, it's going to be um, it's going to be glory all around about you, amen. And uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a difference, and I love the anointing. I love the presence. You know, I love the presence um, of God absolutely. But Moses said, "Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going further unless your presence goes with me." And God visited him. The presence went with him. But then he said these words: "Show me your glory." There was a there was a difference, and there was, and I believe God is bringing visitation to this place already. That there is a a, a a release of that, but I believe you're going to see a greater measure. Um, one of the things that um, God, I love in His Word, that He gives us insight so can, we can see what we've been going through because He wants to give us revelation of what we're coming into. Amen. And God is a God of times and seasons. He's a, a He has eternity in mind. And because he has to live with us for all eternity, he's doing as much work on us as possible. Amen. <laughs> so there's a scripture in um, in uh, Corinthians, and it's First Corinthians, and it's uh, chapter ten, verse thirteen. And um, First Corinthians chapter ten. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for every person who's here today that you love. You love them with an everlasting love. First Corinthians, chapter ten. And it's verse 13. It says there, Therefore, um, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above and beyond what you are able, but with every temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And I found when I read that scripture, I, I said to God, well, what is it? Are you going to make me a way of escape? Or am I going to have to put up with it? I'm going to have to bear it, you know? I'd rather beam me up, Scotty. I'd rather get out of this situation. And it was a bit confusing that you're going to make a way of escape. I was a great escape artist, you know, uh, the artful dodger. If I could get out of anything, I would. And so the, the, the Lord goes after that in our life. So I want to just give you, like as I looked at that scripture, it means this, no adversity tests or being put to the proof has overtaken you, has seized you. That, but that which is common to all of God's people. But God is trustworthy, hallelujah. God is trustworthy that, uh, that he will not permit you to be tested above what you are able, your ability or your power to endure. But together with that test, he will also provide an end, an exit, a way out, a way out, that you may be able to bear or to stand up underneath that pressure. I want to say the world speaks about having an IQ level and then they've now been talking about the EQ, the, the emotional quota, emotional maturity. But God speaks about the AQ level, the adversity quota. And in fact, they're doing that in the business world. They'll test people under pressure as whether they're going to be good company managers or to be able to lead. And our ability to handle pressure will largely determine how much of the purposes of God we're going to walk in. Amen? And so God has a plan for our lives and he allows us to go through pressure because of what he wants to bring us into. When a person goes for their license, it's because they're ready to be released into a new realm of freedom. It's because they're ready to be able to get that driver's license and go and have all this freedom. So the test they go through is not a cruel thing but it actually releases them into a new season. And we have been in a season, I believe, where God has been allowing the tests and the trials. Amen? In the World Book of Heroic Failures, there is um, people that have won their place in of fame by their amazingly outstanding failures. <laughs> and the recorded number of driver's tests a woman went for was 40. You've got to say that, you know. <laughs> Amen? I want to pray for you if you have trouble going for a driver's test today. <laughs> But, um, you know, the driving instructor will sit in the seat sometimes beside that individual that's having the test and deliberately leave their seatbelt off. Not to trick them, not to trip them up, but to prepare them if they're going to get in the car and take their little brother or sister down to the shops, they'll make sure they put the seatbelt on. Those things are for our own safety, amen? And we've been going through a season of trials and testing. The Bible says that we're to run the race 
whether run the race so as to be able to win the prize. And, uh, and so God allows us to go through tests because he wants to promote us. Jesus grew in favour with God and man. It's not enough to say, well, God loves me. I've got all these gifts and all this favour. But we have to grow in favour with man, with people around about us. Someone recently shared this amazing um, true story. And because it's an, it was a, an American statistic thing that happened, I, I wasn't aware of it. But apparently back in the 1980s in the Boston Marathon, there was a woman called Rosie Cruz that she actually ran in the Boston Marathon. She was the first, first woman to arrive at the finishing line and then they gave the prize to the first man. But someone actually started to get suspicious because she wasn't really sweating like the other ones. <laughs> she wasn't really, she didn't look that worn out like the other ones. And then um, uh, they started to really look into it and there was another guy that um, thought that, um, that they'd seen her run out of the crowd. And then finally, they reckon that someone came forward that had seen her on, on the bus. <laughs> so instead of, they, they went through the cameras and they checked all the checkpoints where all the runners came in and got their water and everything, and she wasn't at any of the checkpoints. And it looks like she took off with the rest and got, went and got on the bus and got off around near the last lap and just ran out of the crowd. And, <laughs> and she got the prize for a while. <laughs> but I want to say we cannot get the prize if we keep getting on the bus. Amen? There are things that God allows us to go through, tests. And uh, I want to talk about the, the, um, the pits of promotion, the checkpoints, because the Bible says, you know, um, in Isaiah 51, he says, um, it says, look to the rock from which you were hewn and from the pit from which you were dug, the quarry, the pit. There's a scripture in Psalm, the hundred, Psalm, um, gosh, anyway, it's there in Psalm somewhere. <laughs> Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, who heals all your uh, diseases, who, who forgives all your iniquities, who satisfies your mouth with good things, who redeems your life from the pit. And oftentimes we say in life, that was just the pits. That was just the pits. And the pit is a, a pitfall is a hidden or unexpected difficulty or danger. And so God allows us to go through processes. And uh, I found, I've read this, that when, you're, um, when you face hard things, it develops new brain cells. Isn't that good news? <laughs> good news for all the blondes here? <laughs> when you face hard things, you actually develop new brain cells. And I guess the, the diminishing happens when you back off. If you run away from things, it's, life gets harder. If you keep catching the bus, life will get difficult. Amen? That when Rosie Cruz got found out, and of course her medal was stripped from her, 20 years later she ran the Boston Marathon properly. I, for one, do not want to have to wait 20 years. I add an extra 20 years onto my destiny because I keep getting on the bus, you know, keep dodging, keep, keep slipping out the back jack and finding a new plan, friend. So um, I want to speak about the process that God allows us to go through, and we don't know what's ahead. I, I love the story of um, Cliff Young, you know, Cliffy Young, um, and uh, he, he's a guy that had no idea that he was going to be famous, that they could movie out of him. He was not doing the things he was doing to be famous. He, he was, uh, lived all his life on the one property and uh, they had like 2,000 sheep and 3,000 acres or something like that. And, and, and he just looked after the sheep. And what happened? The truck broke down. The truck broke down and he had to kind of go after the sheep on foot. And so he would just be out there day and night rounding up the sheep and then the dog died and he would bark. He would bark. <laughs> that develops your lungs. <sighs> And he's out there, <laughs> he's just doing it to round up the sheep because he's looking after the sheep. But he learned to run day and night. And when they had that marathon from, was it Sydney to Melbourne, and all those guys are there with their Nikes and their outfits and all that stuff, and Cliffy in his 60s comes up with his gumboots and shuffles up, and they thought he must have been one of the spectators. Puts his name down, and <coughs> putting his name down. <laughs> but as they head off, all, the, all those in training and look the part, 
Yes, Cliffy, shuffle them along. But you see, they've got their five-day marathon worked out, that they sleep for these hours and then they get back on the track. And while they're sleeping, he's shuffling through the night because he's got stamina. He's been looking after sheep. He's not wanting to be famous. He's just doing what he needs to do. And he shuffles along. He shuffles past them. And they can't believe it that this old bloke, this old, compared to them, <laughs> I can't be careful of what I say, getting on. And, and, um, and so he, sh and, and blow me down if he doesn't come out in front. He wins the jolly thing. And they gave him the prize money. He didn't even know there was prize money. He got embarrassed. He said, I just thought it was a race. You know, we just get out there and have some fun. He was so embarrassed, he divvied up the money with all the runners. He had no idea what God was, not God, I don't know if he knows the Lord, but he had no idea he would be absolutely famous. But he, he ran the race properly. Amen? Though some of those guys might have just uh, done a bit of training but thought, I looked the part. You know, I've, I've got these rippling muscles, but there is a, an endurance, there's a stamina. Amen? So I want to look at three great men of God who actually became great because of the pits they were in. And I want to look at the fact that we've been in pits of promotion. Amen? Pits of promotion. The first guy I want to look at, and he is in First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 11. His name is Beniah. First Chronicles. Chapter 11. It says there in First Chronicles chapter 11, Beniah was the son of Jeho Well, actually, if you read the scripture beforehand, it's talking about um, uh, how that they was numbering all these mighty men of God. And it says, Beniah was the son of Jehodia, the son of a valiant man, who actually had done many great deeds. He killed two lion-like heroes, and in some translations it says to platoons, um, from Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. So he, on a bleak day, when there was no one around, he's having to face a lion. He's taking on things on a bleak day when there's nothing, uh, no one around to help him. The Bible says he killed an Egyptian, a great man of height, and he took the Egyptian spear, which was like a weaver's beam. He wrestled it out of him and he killed him with his own spear. These things Beniah did and won a name among the mighty three, the three mighty men. And he was more honored than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his guard. David said, I want this guy right beside me. I want someone like that with courage to be part of my personal God, body, bodyguard. You'll read this. Um, um, you know, that it says, and he didn't attain to the three. Maybe it kind of bugged him. He felt maybe I just wasn't good enough. But, you know, like I was coming back from an overseas trip and, um, and, uh, and uh, I read, you know, some notes and some books for about four hours and I still had about eight hours to go. And I thought, oh, I'll watch whatever's on. And I watched The Sound of Music again for the 60th time. <laughs> I can almost quote the words that they say. It's really a good movie. Anyway, and then there was nothing. I thought I'll, I'll watch Keanu Reeves in uh, The Matrix. That's it. The Ma yes, good old Matrix. And then I watched Tom Cruise in The Edge of Tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, they got more action oriented. But when I was watching The Matrix, he kept saying, I'm not the hero. I'm not the guy you're looking for. And that script was written by a Christian, by the way. It was Mordecai that's looking for him. The Nebuchadnezzar was the ship and they were going to Zion, you know, it's like. And, um, but he said, no, I'm not, I, I can't be that person. And they had this kind of like module where he, he, he actually could download, hook up and download different programs. And when he was um, being taught how to fight and how to stand and all that, they'd say, download the jiu-jitsu program, download the, 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 the fighting program, download the helicopter pilot program. And a lot of the things we're going through is not necessarily for immediate breakthrough, but God's saying, download the praise program, download the prayer program, download the warfare program. He's training us, amen, how to stand on the evil day. He's equipping us for the future. And many times the things we're going through are to train us. And here's Beniah. It says that he didn't attain to the three, and yet he came into being David's personal bodyguard. But in a time of transition, 
when Solomon is establishing a new army and Joab has defected, he's looking for someone who will head up the entire armed force of the, is of the uh, nation of Israel. And he picks Benaiah, a guy who not only attained to the first three, but he began to step into a role he never thought would be his because he was faithful in the pit. He was faithful in the season. He didn't get on the bus. He didn't dodge the season he was in. And so God raised him up and he led the whole nation's army into victory. Amen? I want to look at the second, second pit. You know, we've got to let go of the gospel on my terms. The gospel on my terms. Well, I'm a busy person. I love Jesus. I have my quiet time. I have my little devotion. And I can come to church once a month. I'll send in my tithes. I want to say whatever happened to passion, whatever happened to David saying, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be anywhere else. Where did the passion go? The gospel on my terms is no gospel. It's not recognised by this Bible. Amen? It's not recognised. We cannot come up to the finishing line. Give me my uh, promises that are yea and amen. Amen. There's, there's a, you know, we've got to run the race so that we can receive the prize. Second one I want to look at is the pit of injustice. The pit of injustice. Who's the pin-up boy for that one? Joseph. Amen. Joseph. Joseph. The Bible says that he had an incredible um, favour from his father, a coat of many colours. He was beloved of his father and yet uh, he was so favoured that his brothers were jealous and then God gave him a dream. And the dream was that, you know, the, the sheaves are going to bow down to you. And, and because he was an empty-headed kid that couldn't keep his mouth shut around his brethren, you see, the Bible says, Mark, the upright person, the wise person, the person that can control their words is going to rule. Amen? But J Joseph couldn't keep his mouth shut. He was daddy's favourite. He was, he was the favourite. And he said, oh, you're going to actually bow down to me? Ooh, yeah. He's had this dream, and you're actually going to bow down to me? And they got so angry. And they were, ugh. He's really, he's really puffing himself up. And then he has another dream that the sun and the moon bows down to him and all the 11 stars, he had 11 brothers. And he just blurts it out. He already knows they're angry. He already knows he's got under their skin. He thought, I'm going to really stick it to them. I had a dream. Mum and Dad. You're going to have to line up and get a ticket to talk to me. I'm going to be so famous. I'm going to be the most important person in this family. <laughs> you see, God had a destiny for him. It was like, uh, there's a wagon train leaving town. Be on it. <laughs> It'll take you to your destiny. And oftentimes God allows us to go through tailor-made experiences to prepare us for an incredible future if we'll only allow him. And as Joseph, he, he, he gets thrown into a waterless pit. He gets thrown into that place by those brothers. His coat is stripped from him. He goes through three strippings. The brothers strip it from him. Pharaoh's wife, who tries to commit adultery with him, strips it from him. The last stripping is when he takes it off himself to put on the coat of destiny. Amen? But there was a process. The empty, empty waterless pits of the dead-end days of difficult jobs, difficult seasons, where God's saying, you're going to check out, you're going to spit the dummy, you're going to shake your fist at me, you're going to sing those someone done me wrong songs, or you're just going to serve, you're just going to pour yourself out. And the half-brothers, you're going to have to deal with the half-brothers. People are only half with you. You're going to have to recognize that there are half-brothers. Amen. And the Bible says that he was in prison because he did the right thing, and he was ministering to the butler and the baker. I want to say the butler was the key to his entire destiny. Do not dismiss the day of small beginnings. Don't think that it's a small thing that you would get the opportunity to serve in the house of God, to minister to children, to come to a home group, to spend time talking to that person that's lonely, to reach out to that widow or that divorced person. This is pure an undefiled religion that you would look after the widows and the orphans. Amen? They're the divorced. They're the single parents of today's society because one of those may be the key. God says, I see your heart. I'm now going to unlock your destiny. 
And it's not easy if you're in a prison. Most prisoners have probably got huge history of things that if you say, what's the matter? <laughs> you're probably going to be stuck there about four, year, four, <laughs> four hours. Really? Wow, it was that bad. And that's okay. But if you don't have compassion, if you say, I'm a busy person, I've got an important destiny, there'll be other people that can sit with those sort of people. I want to say you just walk past the very key to the future God's got for you. You just got on the bus and miss the checkpoint of do you serve, amen? You, you don't have to be humble to serve, but you can't be humble. You don't have, to, you know, don't have to be humble to serve, but you can't serve. You've got it back to front. You can serve without being humble, but you can't be humble without serving. I would question your humility, amen? And so the Bible says of Joseph, he allowed God to process him in that place. He served in a lowly place. And the Bible says in um, Genesis 41 when God gave Pharaoh a dream. And I want to just read a, a scripture there, Genesis 41. It says God gave Pharaoh a dream and God initiated the change. God knows when time's up. God knows when there's a, the agitation has settled down. Because I've been doing a, a, a um, study on the anointing oil in Exodus 30. And one of the ingredients, the acacia, it comes from a plant that's roots have to go down deep, deep, deep into the soil beside a river. And I want to say, if you don't allow your roots to go down deep, deep recognises deep. If you don't allow your roots to go down deep enough, it will dwarf the tree. It can only grow so far because your roots didn't go down deep enough. God wants our roots to go down deep enough. Amen? And we see when God gives Pharaoh a dream and finally the butler who's positioned now to say, I know a man. You only need one person to know your name, amen? You don't need a whole bunch of people. You only need one person to know your name. The Bible says that Joseph said these words to Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. He wasn't going, oh, it's not me. He meant it by deep revelation. There's nothing in me. He's not saying, I've had this dream, everyone's going to bow down to me, and finally I get my big opportunity. <laughs> he said, it's, it's, it's not in me. He had a true, true estimation. He had a true humility. He said, it's not in me. But he had a confidence in God. He said, God will give Pharaoh the interpretation. Gives the interpretation, Genesis 41, and Pharaoh says, can anyone's equal be found in the kingdom? And he gives that word and that advice. Can anyone's equal be found in that kingdom? He said, nobody will um, lift up a hand or will move in this whole nation except under the direction of this man. And he will only be under me and he will be, have the authority of the whole nation. And 30 years old, Joseph becomes the leader of the greatest nation in the world. He did all his training in one small area. God may be preparing you in children's church to have a worldwide ministry. God may be preparing you in home group. He may be preparing in that place that you're serving. Don't give away your Goliath. Don't pull your roots up so that you end up being a small tree. Amen? God wants you to know that there's a coat of favour. Joseph was given the mantle. It says, give Joseph the mantle, the royal coach, the royal you know, ring, the royal authority, because he went through the pit of injustice. Sometimes it's not fair. Life's not fair, amen, but God is good all the time. I've found that to be true, that life isn't fair. And there are half-brothers and sisters, but as we allow God to keep our hearts sweet and we don't get an attitude of bitterness, because we can actually cut off the very agent of change God's allowed us to go through. When you forgive the unforgivable, when you release that which is Absolutely, you have every right in the natural to hold it over a person, but you let it go and you release grace. God says, oh, you're ready. I can open that door. Amen. Third one I want to look at is David in uh, the pit of discouragement. We're going to have to be, um, we'll have a stop off at this pit en route to our destiny. Amen. So we're going to turn to 1 Samuel 30. The, um, if you're going to make a horror story, you can call it Ziglag. And uh, it's a pit of discouragement and it's a time when David had been through um, a long time in the wilderness. The training, the, the warfare he was going through was to build the man. 
was to strengthen the man. And yet uh, he came to a place where he settled. He settled. And you know, I came to a place where I settled once. And I remember the, there was, uh, I was uh, divorced on my own and uh, I had these terrible heart, uh, chest pains. My, my heart was beating through my chest. My kids were running amok. My middle girl was, um, I had gone and hit the nightclubs and had a, a friends that were undesirable, so to speak. And, and I, just, uh, I just felt like I was losing control of them and struggling this whole time. And I was not, even though I loved reading Catherine Kuhlman books, I loved reading about the miracles and that, I wasn't saying, Lord, I, I want to be a world changer. I want to see miracles. My prayer had been reduced because there are times when Maddie had come, come home, forget her key, and I'd be, I'd be in bed with my heart beating through my chest. I couldn't lie on one side because... It was so painful. And, and I'd see, hear the window in the lounge slowly open. And I'd be watching the hall, see that the axe man come to get me. Well, it's Maddie home safe again. <laughs> I'll be Madeline home safe again. <laughs> hey, glory to God. And God got a hold of her, amen. But he was, God was going after something in my life because I settled. I wasn't praying the miracle prayer. I was saying, God, just keep me alive. Till I know all my kids are walking with you. God, just keep me alive till I know they're all walking with you, Jesus. That's all. I'll settle for that. But God has so much more than us settling. Amen? And where we've, where we've come to a place where we'll even, you know, we've had prayer and maybe we're believing for healing, but it's like, um, well, I know that uh, it doesn't seem to work for me, but I'll still go out and have cursory prayer, and, you know, just, uh, you know, and... Um, a little bit of anointing, but there's something that we start to settle. And God wants to break that off our lives, amen? And he wants to bring us to a new place. And I remember being in a meeting sometime later, and, and, uh, and uh, there was a woman testifying how God healed her heart before she went for heart surgery. And I had, had these chest pains and things like that, and I just reached out and I said, God, what you did for her, can you please do it for me? Can you do it for me? You do it for me, Jesus. And from that day forward, those symptoms began to subside and subside until they totally disappeared. Amen? Never came back. But, but there is a reach of the heart that God is looking for, not to settle. Because he gave it had settled. He said these words, I now know I'll one day die by the hand of Saul. First Samuel 27. Didn't say I'm having a hard time. I'm discouraged. He said, I know that I'm, like, no, I'm not going to get out of this. I'm going to die. Saul's going to get me, and, and now I'm going to just go behind enemy lines and hide in the Philistine country where they weren't meant to go. God said, don't go into the enemy's land, but he went over there. He didn't even know Saul had stopped chasing him. Went to his friend King Achish, who gave him the town of Ziglag, and he lived in the daytime as if he's at peace with King Achish, but at night they went on raiding parties against the Amalekites, who were despicable. They used to pick off the women and children. They'd come after and kill the infirm. God says, I hate the Amalekites. And so David was always still going after the Amalekites. And they came back, and as you know, the city was burnt to the ground. And it'd be like, it'd be like in a day if you got word that the Taliban came to your house and kidnapped your kids, your wife, that, 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 that you've been bankrupt and, and your house caught fire. And then your neighbours started to turn on you because you caused the house fires. They picked up rocks. In a day, in a day, he faced this. It got a whole lot worse. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Sometimes you get to rock bottom. There's a scripture that says, underneath are the everlasting arms. That word underneath means the bottom. When you hit rock bottom, his arms are underneath you. Amen? But you know what he's after? He's after bedrock faith. He's after where the dry bones are so dry, all they'll have now is glory. There won't be any flesh. God will take you to bedrock because he wants to pour glory out upon you. Amen? The Bible says David got to that place and um, it says that David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of every person was grieved and every man his son, for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. It could have said, but David gave up. The people stoned him and they tossed his body on the burning rubble of Ziglag. God was very displeased and began to look for a new king. Could have read that. 
Because on a day like that, you would have understood where he said, God, it's too much. I've had it up to here. I can't cope with any more. I find that when I'm in church, I face battles. I'm just going to get a little property out west and I'm just going to do my own thing out there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to mix with people anymore. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Word of the Lord. <laughs> Word of knowledge. Not fair. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just going to check out. Maybe not give up. But, you know, you, there's some people and you think you're well within your rights to chuck in the towel, to throw it in. It's not fair. It's not fair. But everything was resting upon one man's choice. Your children and your children's children, everything's resting upon how you handle the battles of life. Are you gonna, you're going to give up? Are you going to whinge about the church? Are you going to leave church? Are you going you're gonna to be at the beach on a Sunday and they're going to say, oh, well, mum did it. Grandma did it. No, I want my kids to love the house of God because that's going to save them. That's going to keep them. No matter what you're going through, don't abandon the house of God. Don't check out when things are tough. One man's choice as he stood there and he said these words, bring me my ephod, bring me my prayer shawl. You see, up to that time, he had prayed. He had believed God, but the strengthening of his faith was what it was about. And you might say, well, I prayed and that never changed. I prayed and I still seem to have to go through that battle. I prayed. But everything was dependent upon this man praying again. Would he pray again? Faith prays again. When, they, when my daughter brought home our little grandson, Jack, and he has to sleep in their bedroom and in their room to bond, and he bonded well and he was going well. A few months down the track, Maddie, they tuck him in, they say his stories, tell him his story, pray with him. And he was a little champion. He wasn't scared of the dark or anything like that. He was, and they tuck him in. Maddie heard a noise coming from the bedroom. And she went up close to listen. And she realized it was soft, soft crying. And she went in and Jack was there in his little bed. At the end of their bed, it's a Thomas the Tank Engine bed. And, he's, and his face was wet. His pajama top is wet. He is sobbing, but he's sobbing quietly because orphans don't think anyone's going to come because we can get to a place where we don't think God's going to come. And God wants you to know it's time. Just like Jack, Maddie said, Jack, Jack, you've got you to use, you've got to cry out. You've got to cry out to Daddy. You've got to cry out to Mummy. To try, practice, Daddy, Mummy, no, Jack. You got to use your big voice, Daddy, Mummy. You got to use your big voice, Jack. And God's saying to the church, you got to use your big voice, Ch church. You got to use your big voice of faith because God's about to bring a shift. Amen. I tell you what, He learned to use His big voice. <laughs> his greatest, uh, does, you know, thing is to sit with me, Nine Nine, <laughs> just Chinese and Nana, and to go through the toy catalog. And it's not the either or. <laughs> On this and this and this and that and that. Unfortunately, he's got a nana that is making up for the couple of years he wasn't with us. So, but you've got to use your big voice. You see, something came into David's life that so shifted him and his six hundred men that were going to kill him. A fresh wind. Neil was prophesying that he said, believing for that new wind, and this incredible. Strength came into David. When you go from having the worst day of your life, to rise up in faith. Love the musicians come and to rise up like that and to stand and say, Lord, what will I do? And you see God spoke to him. God told me he's going to speak to every person here. He's going to speak to you. Maybe a prophetic word, maybe a scripture, but he personally is going to speak into every situation. And David said, what will I do? And God says, get ready for the anointing is now shifting and you will recover everything. The anointing is now shifting. And he picked up the crown. He went after them all. It was a wealthy place. They had so much spoil. There were days sharing it out to every person in the wilderness that helped David. He never faced that. It was the last battle of an old season. He stepped into that ruling as a king. He came in to such a fresh wind. Hallelujah. And like a runner, when they hit the wall, sometimes when they hit that second wind, many of you, the word of the Lord is coming a second time. 
They hit that second wind and they run their fastest lap after that. The Naiaf, he rose to his best years. Joseph ruled over the greatest nation in the world at that time. David picked up the crown and led Israel into its golden years. We're at a season of transition. God's about to release mantles. He's about to release destinies. And I believe that the one thing he's looking for in our hearts is saying, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm, I'm not checking out. If I got on the bus, I'm getting off real quick and I'm going to start to run. I'm going to run that race. I'm going to love the unlovely. I'm going to serve where you plant me. I'm going to let my roots. I'm going to be a person who doesn't flit and flight and flee away. I'm going to be a person who lets their roots go down deep because I want to be the big tree. I want to grow to everything you want me to be. Can we just stand right now? There's a story that um, if you could picture a boxing ring and all the Christians around about and in the ring is Satan and the Christian. And the Christians are, are all around about looking and there's the referee and, uh, and uh, Satan deals a blow that smashes the Christian out and all then the bleachers are looking on and as the referee begins to count one, two, three, four, five, the Christians are looking on, they're leaning in, six, seven, eight, nine, Is someone counting with me, sorry funny joke, <laughs> ten, ten, the Christians are and then the, ref, then the um, referee's going 11, 12, 13, 14. Satan goes, what? And he said, uh, I don't know if you know my name. My name's Grace and Grace keeps counting. No matter what you've been through this morning, amen. <laughs> the supernatural of God and his power is here to walk you into your destiny, to usher you into a new place. He's going to release a fresh wind, amen. He's going to release a fresh wind. There's coming a fresh mantle of prayer over this church. It's coming. You have a great heart for prayer. And I see people gathering. I see half nights of prayer. I see a passion for prayer uh, touching people who don't normally come to the prayer meeting. The hour of power it sounds awesome. Amen. Come along to that. I believe that God is going to open up the windows of heaven and release divine miracles. This is the season of glory. Amen. It transitioning into glory today, right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never accepted Jesus or you've been away from God, or maybe you, you're wanting to recommit your life to Christ, and with no one looking around, all I'm going to ask you to do is lift up your hand to Him, not to me or to anyone else. Lift up your hand to Him today. So Jesus, today I want that new beginning. I want to be born again. I want to be that new person. That's you today. I don't want to miss anybody. Hallelujah. Well, this morning I believe God wants to release a fresh wind. Hallelujah. He wants to pour out his presence, his glory. But I believe that this fresh wind, you're going to know that God's the next relay, right? The next lap is going to be your best years. It's going to be your best season. Amen. He saved the best time till now. And so right now, maybe you've been in the pit of warfare. Maybe you've been like Benaiah, wondering, well, I didn't attain to the three. Well, hello, God's got something far greater than the three. He led the whole nation's army. Maybe you're in the pit of injustice where you were betrayed. I want to say this, Judas did more for positioning Jesus for his life's purpose than any other disciple. The betrayal set him up to go to the cross, which delivered all of humanity. Amen. The injustice, the pit of injustice. Maybe you've been in the pit of discouragement. And one of the greatest things that happened to David, that he made a choice, come hell or high water, I will say, bring me my prayer sure. That in his DNA, in his GPS, there was at a bedrock that no matter what happens, I will choose to keep my eyes upon you. But though he slay me, yet will I praise him. For I know I'm going to come forth. And I'm coming forth with gold. Amen? Maybe there's been a temptation to get on the bus. To just do church on your terms. God on your terms. You know what? Your terms are no terms. 
to God. It's God's way, it's Yahweh or the highway. Amen? And today, I believe God is calling us into the race. But I believe today he wants to release a fresh word, just like David, in that contending time. And yet God had a word right into that situation that turned it all around and brought him out into that destiny. The transition season is upon you now and you're coming out into a place that you've believed for, prayed for, trained for all your life. Amen? And so whether you feel like you've been in the warfare pit or the injustice pit or the discouragement pit or maybe you just feel like you've been running like Cliff Young. That's a prophetic word there because his last name's Young. God's going to give you back the years. The canker worm, the locust, the caterpillars eaten. Amen? God's going to renew your youth like the eagle. Hallelujah. And the generations are going to come together in this house. But I just want to open up the altar. If you feel that you've been in any of those situations or you feel like you've just been on the run, just running that race and it just doesn't seem to be any, any end in sight, I want you to know God's looking today and he's releasing your licenses. And when you are licensed, not, not in the natural but in the spirit, licensed to step into God's destiny, licensed to, to dispense his presence, he's, he's giving people credentials and licenses because there have been tests that he's allowed you to go through. And now God says, get ready to step out into that new place. If that's you today, I just want you to slip out of your seat wherever you are. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to lay hands on people.